listening to the Pro Bono Happy Hour. I'm Rena Glazer. Welcome back. Today's guest is Teresa Hughes of Stinson Leonard Street. Teresa is based in Minneapolis, and we discussed her career and experiences directing a law firm pro bono program, including some inspiring stories about the firm's Diner Legal Clinic. We hope you enjoy our conversation. Hi, Teresa. Welcome to the Pro Bono Happy Hour. Thank you for making the time for us. Well, thank you for having me. I'm pleased to be a part of this. Great. Let's jump right in. Could you tell us about your background, a little bit about your career, and how you got to be the director of Pro Bono at what is now Stinson Leonard Street? Uh, Sure. Well, um, I have the distinct honor of starting my legal career as the uh, Reginald Heber Smith Fellow, uh, one of the last uh, Reginald Heber Smith Fellows out of the Legal Services Corporation. And that was, uh, for those who are maybe too young to know what that fellowship is about, it was part of uh, President Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty, where he sent young lawyers out um, into either the inner city Uh, distressed neighborhoods or out to rural areas and so I was one of the rural area uh, legal aid lawyers that started in the mid 80s working for legal aid in northern Minnesota as a family law attorney and I also um, worked as a public defender in in Ramsey County here in Minnesota and then uh, after that I spent 10 years managing the Minnesota Justice Foundation which was a nonprofit group dedicated to involving law students in either public interest careers or for those who decided to go into private practice to make sure that they stayed committed to pro bono work and understood the importance of giving back um, through the legal profession, even if they had a private career. So I did all of that, and then one day one of my former board members from the Minnesota Justice Foundation called me and said that the law firm at that time of Leonard Street and Dinard was looking for a pro bono director and would I be interested. And um, initially I really wasn't interested until I found out that there was a legal clinic that was managed and um, funded and uh, directed by the law firm in the Phillips neighborhood of Minneapolis, which was one of the poorest neighborhoods in the Twin Cities, and so um, that along with the opportunity to work with a law firm that had a strong, vibrant pro bono program lured me into, out of the public sector and into the private sector to serve as the pro bono director at at Van Lennon Street and Dinard. That is awesome, and we we are going to come back and talk a lot about that clinic for sure, Um, and I'm excited to learn that you were a Reggie. I don't think I knew that, or... If I did, I had forgotten. That's that's amazing. I am. <laughs> so before we pivot and talk more about the firm, what in your background or life experience motivated you to pursue a public interest pro bono career? That's a great question, and I'm not sure I really know. I just... Um... At some point, I guess when I was an undergraduate, um, I just had this desire to be involved um, in the legal system, in the legal process, um, to make sure that everybody had access to what I saw as sort of the positive things in our society, um, decent shelter, a job, sort of the basic human rights that um, I think we should all be able to take for granted, but unfortunately, many folks don't have a shot at those things. And so initially, I think I always thought that um, I would go uh, the political route, and my original um, focus was to go to Washington, D.C. and work on someone's campaign or work in the office as a staffer, and then somehow I got swept up into law school, and then once I was there, of course, I realized that this was really an important tool for me to um, kind of pursue my dream of, you know, being a part of this system that would make things more equitable for folks. So then it became obvious through um, the clinical courses that I took, the um, Legal Aid for Minnesota Prisoners or the LAMP Clinic. I was a student director there. 
and I also was a law clerk um, for two years in the public defender's office. So that's when I knew that this was sort of my calling. So there, so then the Reginald Heber Smith Fellowship was sort of the logical step out of law school and into practice. Social purpose work comes in all forms, and I think that's something that we learn over the course of our schooling and career, that there are many ways to live our values. Um, we'd like to learn more about the firm and the firm's pro bono program. Could you give us an overview? Sure. Um, well, Stinson Leonard Street is a mid-sized uh, law firm. Um, we we were sort of born um, three and a half years ago out of a merger between a law firm in Kansas City, Missouri, um, Stinson, Morrison, and Hecker, and then the law firm in uh, Minneapolis, Leonard Street and Dinard. And so those two firms came together in January of, of 2014, and um, so two and a half years ago, and we now have um, eight offices, or no, excuse me, we now have offices in eight states and, and also an office in the District of Columbia. And so we're a civil litigation law firm, and uh, that's kind of our background. And, um, and then being present in all of those states um, and the firm, you know, having signed the pro bono challenge shortly after we merged, provides us with a platform to carry on, you know, our pro bono mission and even a broader uh, arena than either firm was able to do when we were separate. Well, thank you for acknowledging the challenge and also D.C.'s lack of statehood. <laughs> we're, we're here in D.C., so <laughs> we appreciate that, that accuracy. Um, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the current... Um, structure of the firm's pro bono program. Let's talk about your role as the director of pro bono and how you spend your time. Sure. Well, um, I sort of wear a couple of different hats. And uh, as the director of pro bono, I work very closely with firm leadership, with our pro bono committee, which is the policy setting entity um, at the firm for the pro bono program. So I work very closely with both of those groups um, to make sure that we have a robust pro bono program and that it's one that sort of meshes um, and fits the culture of our firm. Um, I also uh, manage our pro bono director who's in our Kansas City office and who is primarily responsible for the day-to-day -day pro bono operations in our Kansas City, St. Louis, Wichita, and Omaha offices. Um, but I also, being a bit selfish, have not um, given up my role as the primary contact at the firm's um, legal clinic in the Phillips neighborhood of Minneapolis. And there's some creative tension there because I have certainly taken on um, more administrative responsibilities since the firm has doubled in size and expanded its footprint. Um, into so many other areas. But having said that, I feel like um, one of the ways, having been in this position for 14 years, that I can still stay passionate about what I do and really um, dedicated to getting all of our lawyers involved in pro bono and, you know, kind of carrying the torch um, for the program firm-wide is to be able to sit across this, the table from people who but for access to, you know, justice or access to an attorney, our, their, their lives are going to be extremely difficult. So having that one-on-one -on -one connection with clients um, at our legal clinic and still being sort of the primary liaison between the Minneapolis office and this medical legal partnership um, keeps me juiced up and fueled. However, having said that, time management is a bit of an issue, but that's another discussion for another day. So that's what I do on a daily basis. Like most people in the public interest sector or in the pro bono arena, I'm a really good juggler and keep trying to keep all those balls going. 
That's awesome, Teresa. And I'll say, I know you're you're gonna eventually dip a toe into the water of podcasts. And I'll say that a couple of weeks ago we did an episode with a time management expert <laughs> for tips for ah. how busy pro bono leaders and other people could juggle time. So maybe that'll be one we start you with. But um, one of the things I think that we all need is to carve out time to do something that we feel passionately about. That gives us energy. That feeds our soul. And so time that you get to spend on the clinic does that. It is valuable. Even if there are a million things pulling at your attention, finding things that really speak to us are worth it, you know, and, and pay off in in effect in, in increasing our efficiencies and, and also in our personal and professional satisfaction. So she would endorse what you're doing. <laughs> well, thank you. That's good to hear. <laughs> and to, I guess, answer sort of the second half of your question in terms of the structure of the program. So, um, you know, we have a pro bono committee that's made up of attorneys from all of our larger offices. So it's a very uh, large committee, 22 people. But since it is more of a policy group and also it's really where we kind of come together to talk shop and the offices report on what they're doing and what their challenges are. It, it kind of works having this large group. And then um, the two committee co-chairs oversee sort of the broader, you know, larger topics. I mean, they're my go-to people. Having said that, um, I also report to our deputy managing partner, Allison Murdoch, on anything, you know, of significance, and then our COO. So we're all sort of in this together, and then the pro bono manager reports to me. Is there anything that you wish you could be doing more of if you had infinite time? Well, personally, I would like to be at our legal clinic uh, more often because of the responsibilities. I'm not as present at the clinic as I used to be. Um, having said that, I've, I've got a plan for hopefully being able to move one of our um, staff attorneys, uh, a portion of her time, um, into the clinic, and she's um, fluent in Spanish, so that'll be great in terms of our Latina clients. And then we also are going to have a pro bono resident from one of the Minnesota law schools with us for the academic year. And so I need to work around sort of the supervision pieces of that, but I also am envisioning that that person will also be able to provide more sort of feet on the ground at the clinic. So so that's one thing. I wish I could be more present at the clinic because um, I'm always there when they call and need me and I need to meet with clients. But as you know, um, a lot of sort of business development, for lack of a better word, even in the pro bono arena, um, is when you're present. People are like, oh, I've been meaning to ask you about this, or oh my gosh, I just saw a client yesterday, and here's their issue. What do you think? And so, you know, just seeing me sort of, or somebody from our firm jogs their memories. So, um, so that's what I wish we could do more of for me personally. Um, in terms of the firm, if we had unlimited resources, um, I would love to see us um, establish some type of medical legal partnership in at least our larger offices, which would be um, Kansas City and St. Louis are really our, our largest offices. Um, and then I think it would be also, well, we are actually developing more transactional pro bono work, but if I had unlimited time, I'd like to dedicate um, significant resources to that as well. That's a great segue, I think, an opening to talk more about the clinic. For listeners that may not know, this is such a pioneering example of the ideal values and power of pro bono, right? This this medical legal clinic that you established in 1993, was it, the firm established it? So it it's of long standing. Could you tell us a little bit about the background, the history, the idea behind it? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, well, the clinic predates my arrival to the firm. Um, 
I didn't join uh, then Leonard Street and Diner until 2002 and the clinic, as you mentioned, was launched in 93. However, I was a part of the Minnesota public interest legal community, so I remember the day that it was unveiled and I was at the reception. Little did I know right, right. that a number of years later it would be my <laughs> baby, but I didn't know that at the time. Uh, but anyway, the clinic evolved out of um, really uh, this idea that the executive director of the Community University Healthcare Center, and that's the medical clinic where our legal clinic is housed, and the acronym for the Community University Healthcare Center is COOK, which often <laughs> will get a chuckle or a raised eyebrow, not very politically correct, but given that the majority of our clients have a mental illness, um, the COOK Clinic is well known in the Minnesota community. But anyway, that clinic is actually a teaching arm of the University of Minnesota and has been a medical school and has been around since um, the early 70s or even the late 60s. So Dr. Amos Diner Jr. was the executive director of Kook. He was a pediatrician and he was observing as many um, I'm sure people that are in community clinics see on a daily basis the health impacts on children from substandard housing. And so there were all these kids coming in with lead paint poisoning, uh, children coming in with asthma. And as Dr. Dinard will say, you know, we can put them on a steroid, we get this cleared up, we send them back home, and they come back three or four months later with the same condition. So Dr. Dinard was the son of Amos Dinard Sr., who was one of the founders of our law firm, the original Leonard Street and Dinard. So Dr. Dinard had grown up in a legal family. He knew the power of the law to bring about remedial actions when they're needed. And so he reached out to the firm and asked if we would be willing to partner with him um, to bring legal services to the clients at the Coop Clinic. And as Dr. Uh, Diner likes to say, and the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. And to think how far medical legal partnerships have come, right, from that time, um, realizing their value and impact, it, it, it's incredible. How, other than your presence that we talked about earlier, how do you staff the clinic? How is it run? How are legal services provided? Well, um, I am the primary liaison at the clinic, so the, the uh, typically uh, a client, a prospective client who's a patient at the clinic, um, if they're able, they will call me and tell me sort of what their legal issue is, and I'll get things going, meet with them, um, and then bring the case back for our, we have a screening committee that meets weekly and goes through all of the cases from the clinic and that um, that uh, committee is made up of three partners and an associate and myself as a staff person and we have both litigation and transactional partners on that committee and so they've made the commitment to go through all of the cases that come in during a week and decide if it's an appropriate fit for the firm and then we sort of talk about who we think in terms of our attorneys might be the best fit um, for the case. We have all of our attorneys actually firm-wide divided into public interest pro bono practice groups, but also in the Minneapolis office given the unique needs um, of the patients at the Cook Clinic. We have all our Minneapolis lawyers, which is about 200, um, divided up into various uh, public interest practice groups. So anyway, that's one way the cases come is through me, but then um, we also, uh, the doctors and the nurses will also often call me and uh, refer patients to me and I'll meet with those individuals. But it, that is, as I mentioned, one of the sort of challenges is I am sort of the, the gatekeeper or the main entry point into the, into the firm. Um, all of our lawyers meet at the medical clinic with their clients. That's part of our commitment is getting out into the community and meeting the clients um, where they feel most comfortable 
Um, 60% of our, our clients um, do not speak English as their first language. So, of course, the interpreters, case managers, social workers at the clinic are key not only in terms of being able to make the, com the client feel comfortable when he or she meets with an attorney, but also they're the interpreter for us so we can communicate with our clients. Um, so that's kind of how the cases come and, and how the, the clinic works. And then once the, you know, the lawyer takes on his or her case, then they run with it and they're responsible for, you know, meeting the client and going to court with the client and doing whatever they need to get the client's um, goals um, satisfied. What's the volume like in terms of either cases screened, whatever your metric is per week, mm -hmm. per month, and, a, a, you know, what's so people could have a sense of sort of the, the caseload? Sure. Um, I probably meet with about 200 people a year. Um, and in the past, I've had a paralegal that's assisted me in some aspects. And right now, I don't have that. Um, but um, so I meet with about 200 people a year. And we um, represent, it's almost all full, um, full rep. So I do the advice piece, like, um, I mean, I can do the advice only piece for clients who either need a referral or it's sort of like an interpretation of their legal document or, you know, whatever. But full rep, it's about um, 90 to 100 clients a year get full representation from an attorney at the firm. And what are the range of legal issues that you're working on? Just some examples. Yeah, I mean, I like to call them the big four, um, although that's changing because there are a couple more that are emerging, so it might soon be more the big six. But the big four would be family law, and that includes custody, divorce, child support, and orders for protection or domestic violence. Um, then we do immigration, um, which includes uh, U and T visas, citizenship, um, legal permanent residency, some family reunification, DACA when it was hot, um, you know, sort of all that. But a lot of it is um, green cards and citizenship. And then the third um, piece would be public benefits, so Social Security work. And then the fourth is housing, landlord, tenant, and that type of thing. But the two sort of emerging areas are um, clearly criminal expungements in terms of there was a new new law in Minnesota in January of 2015 that added a number of um, the statute changed so that now crimes that in the past would not have been expunged can be expunged. So that's created a lot more volume and then just a lot of consumer debt issues and if we don't conflict out you know from our billable practice we certainly will help people in that area as well it's kind of a full service clinic obviously we don't well we don't do criminal work and we don't do anything that would be fee generating because we've always been very respectful of the fact that we don't want to be taking business away from smaller practitioners in the community you know, if, if it's a fee-generating matter. Right. Who could, who could do the work at their own rates? It may not be your firm's rates, but there are paying lawyers available who, who could do the work, um, and the client could support that. Um, are there key elements or lessons learned that you could share for how you've been able to sustain this clinic over so many years? I think people find sometimes with pro bono projects of long standing that there becomes fatigue or inertia or interest dies out or circumstances changed. But one hallmark of this now has just been its longevity. Um, are there practical things or leadership things or other aspects to the way this, this clinic has just been so incredible for so long that you could share? You know, I think about that a lot, and I'm, you know, I, I think it's sort of a number of things. I, I, I do think, um, especially historically, the fact that um, the firm sort of owns that clinic. I mean, it's known as, you know, the Dynard Legal Clinic. Everybody in the Twin Cities understands that it's, 
it belongs to our law firm. It's not a clinic that, you know, our lawyers take one or two days out of the month, you know, to go and staff, which we certainly do, and those are great opportunities, and I'm in no way, you know, belittling that type of, of work. And as I said, you know, we participate in other clinics that way as well. But I think, you know, it's our clinic. Um, every new lawyer that comes to the firm is, understands that it's something just a little bit different than any other type of pro bono work that he or she might do because the firm founded it. The firm, you know, I guess, in, you know, does pay for it or subsidizes it. To, um, and there is that, you know, historical tie from our original founders, at least for the Minneapolis office, um, and the original medical founder, there's that sort of family tie and, and sense of pride. And it is, it's just this feeling like, um, oh, it's the clinic. I mean, everybody at the firm just refers to it as the clinic. And so if I send around a case that I'm having trouble staffing, you know, lawyers will jump in and say, well, I'm really busy right now, but since it's the clinic, we can't say no. And they and we could say no, but they mean we don't want to ever say no um, if it meets our criteria. And so they just step up to the plate and do it because there's this sense of ownership and pride um, that just kind of is passed down from every generation of lawyer to the next. So I think pride and skin in the game can really make a difference as these projects become the connective tissue that glue our lawyers together and part of our identity, right? It sounds like it's part of the office and firm identity. It's, it's incredible. It is. I mean, I think it's woven into the fabric of the office and I, the older lawyers in terms of their career, you know, will talk to the younger lawyers about their cases and um, will model, you know, it's not a top-down type of thing where, oh, let's give all the brand new associates lots of legal clinic cases. I mean, we do, but they also look at people who have been practicing law for 30 and 40 years and they know they have a million, two million dollar book of business and they know that, you know, what they do for their billable work and how um, complicated and strategic it is, blah, blah, blah. And yet they still model the commitment of I will step off my, you know, billable practice um, platform and go over to family court and represent, you know, a battered woman in her order for protection hearing or her custody hearing or whatever. And so that that kind of behavior is modeled um, beyond just sort of, you know, you got to walk the walk, right? Not just talk the talk. It really speaks to the power of pro bono for sure. So I know it's hard to pick favorites and a little bit like which child do you love more? No one wants to play that game, especially as you're about to leave on family vacation. But <laughs> <laughs> Could you share some examples of pro bono cases, either that you've worked on directly or that you've seen at the firm that, for whatever reason, have been particularly meaningful to you? Um, well, we have, I mean, there are lots, but I guess one um, case that is my favorite is, or one of my favorite um is, uh, I, and you know, the years after 14 years, the years start blending together, but I'm, I'm thinking this was eight or nine years ago, but a, a woman uh, from the Middle East who came over and married a U.S. citizen, um, and uh, there was severe uh, physical and sexual violence in the marriage, and so um, she came to us. Uh, from her physician at the clinic um, to see if there was some way that this woman, because her immigration status was tied to her abusive husband, and so how could she stay in the United States? Anyway, there you know, was a VAWA petition that was done through immigration, and um, the head of our corporate division, who was a transactional lawyer, um, took the case and represented her um, and was successful in getting the VAWA approved, and uh, when he um, got back from immigration, from the, the uh, 
I think it was more of an interview really than a hearing. Um, he sent me an email and he said, I've been practicing law for over 25 years. I put million dollar deals together for a living and I just had the most significant experience of my legal career in a small dumpy office with gray walls out in immigration. And he said, I never can really go home and tell my kids what I do for a living because it would bore them to tears. But tonight I'm going to go home and tell them what their dad did today at work. And he thanked me and, and just said it was, it, he was just so um, humbled by that experience. And so has now stayed in touch with this client over the years. And, you know, she now is a U.S. citizen. She has a job. She owns her own home. She has a college degree, and she and her son, who she was pregnant with at the time that we did the VAWA, um, are, you know, pursuing their lives in a healthy way. And so that's like one of my favorite stories because, you know, he wasn't some big immigration expert. He wasn't even a litigator. He just availed himself of the resources in the public interest community, had a mentor, and he just figured it out and got it done, and he was able to have this lasting impact on this woman and her son's life and form a new friend. <laughs> so. it, it doesn't always happen, but when it does, having these aha moments can just be profound, um, just absolutely profound for, for lawyers, for our clients, for our communities, for sure. Right. So, Teresa, who's your pro bono role model? You know, I kind, I'd kind i say there are two. Um, one is a woman who's now been retired for a number of years, um, but her name was is uh, Nancy Kleeman, and she was the pro bono um, director. I, I really don't even remember her formal title because she's been um, retired now for probably eight or nine years. But Nancy Kleeman was with the State Bar Association. She was in instrumental in working with folks here in Minnesota to get the IOLTA fund set up, the Legal Services Advisory Committee, um, a whole host of, uh, of pro bono um, sort of mechanisms through the state bar that all of the public interest law offices and the large law firms with pro bono programs were able to um, utilize. And Nancy was the one that, that got um, the pro bono policy initiative going at the state bar where the large law firms were challenged in 1992 through the state bar to um, adopt uh, formal pro bono written policies. So it was under her leadership that so much happened in Minnesota. And so I worked with Nancy a lot when I was the executive director of the Minnesota Justice Foundation. And she, in her own personal time, would help me um, with all these grants. And um, we had a um, Learn and Serve America grant through the Clinton administration on um, uh, public interest in law school, uh, curriculum combined with service in the community and Nancy and her own private time helped me with this grant taught me how to administer a federal grant etc so Nancy and then of course I think everybody of my era you know Esther has been sort of a mentor to all of us um, and raised you know pro bono to the level where people were able to you know pursue it as a career and know that it was an important area of law that, that you could practice in or be involved in as an attorney. Well, thank you for saying that, and thank you for including Esther. It's a nice tribute to her. Um, so one last question before we get you on vacation. If you had a magic wand, what would you change about access to justice? Well, I mean, there would be a lot of things that I think I would change, but <laughs> one thing I would change is I would fund legal services at the level that it needs to be and should be funded. So that would probably, <laughs> if I had the ability to wave my wand, it would it would be to make sure that legal aid had the resources that they needed so that they could serve all people 
um, who had civil legal problems instead of one out of every four or whatever the current statistic is. I think that's still the stat. Wonderful. Well, Teresa, thank you so much for talking with me today. It was a pleasure discussing your career and the firm's pro bono program. Well, thank you. I, thanks for having me, and it was um, a lot of fun, and um, I look forward to uh, coming out to the Institute in March and, and learning more about what's going on on the national level. Thanks for listening to our discussion with Teresa Hughes, and thank you to Teresa for her time and sharing her expertise with us. Additional episodes of the Pro Bono Happy Hour can be found on iTunes and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and take a moment to leave a review. We'd appreciate the feedback, and it would help make it easier for other listeners to find the program and expand the conversation about pro bono and access to justice. Have you heard? The PBI Podcast Network is expanding with a new feed. Want to learn more about the world of in-house pro bono? Stay tuned for the premiere of our new program, which will feature chief legal officers discussing the importance of pro bono and equal access to justice. To learn more about the Pro Bono Institute, visit our website at probonoinst.org. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on the Pro Bono Happy Hour.